begin with where we left all last week concerning the book of John. I want to remind you that John sets out clearly his proposition, and that is uh, set out in the very first chapter, that the word was God. I want us to recognize the fact that the purpose of the book is set out John 20, 30, and 31, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing may, you may have life through his name. Getting those particular things in mind will help tremendously. And John then doesn't write like Mark, Matthew, and Luke. We call them synoptic books because they basically begin with the birth of Christ and go through his life. I didn't mention last week, but this section of the whole of the New Testament, we just simply refer to as biography because what we know about the life of Christ comes from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But John is not writing like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is selecting certain evidences that he presents to prove his proposition. I mentioned that the book does divide itself into the prologue, chapter 1 through verse 1 through verse 18, chapter 1, 1 through 18. And in that, we get the introduction, and might as well call it introduction, that's what it is. And then the Lord's revelation of himself to his disciples, chapters 13 through 20, and what we can call the epilogue, chapter 21. Now again, let me emphasize, I said last week and again a few minutes ago, I alluded to it, John makes no effort to follow the chronological sequence of the Lord's personal ministry. But he is an apostle of Christ. He has undergone the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. He has direct guidance from God through the Spirit. And thus he selects what he selects. But he does so as the Spirit guides him so to do. So he chooses things from various areas of evidences to prove that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. So he, under the guidance of the Spirit, gathers and selects materials related to these specific areas. Now, we studied through the prologue last week, and we ended up by noticing that Jesus is to be approached in a reasonable manner. Time to time, I'll listen to some things on the radio. On, and I'll get on one of these religious state uh, stations. And I couldn't tell you how many times they talked about emotions and feelings and feelings and emotions and how I felt this and how I felt that. And they got it all backwards. God approaches people in an intellectual in a rational way. The very way that faith in Christ is formed depends upon the proper use of your intellect and reasoning powers. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And people won't ask, well, how does the word of God do that? This sort of sin shivers down your spines or give you a good warm feeling communicates to us. And if you read Peter and the other apostles, of course they were doing the same thing Peter was in Acts 2, the day the church started, you'll see how he exercises facts, 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 reasons from those facts, and makes it point. The rejoicing that people do, the manifestation of a good feeling that people have as Christians comes because they know 
There's certainty in what they believe because it's built upon the facts of the gospel. There's no wondering, so I feel bad today, so I must not be saved, and I feel real good today, so I must be. I don't know what happens when you get in between. I guess I'm doing a balancing act. That's what happens when you have emotions that surge and wane and whatever else. Have you ever thought for a minute that your emotions can't really tell you anything? But just take the sense of touch. Somebody touches you. Well, you know something touched you. You may not even know somebody did. You felt it. But you don't know what did it until somebody testifies to you. You may think that somebody touched you with a finger. You may think that somebody touched you with a feather or a pencil. That's feelings. But just try it with you sometime. Let somebody just, you close your eyes and sit there and you can do it this way. Two or three people are in the room. One of them touches you. You don't know who did it, but you know you said, now I won't, well, let's just add five people to it. One of you all touched me. And by the feeling of your touch, I'll tell you who did it. Well, you won't be able to. Might guess it, but it won't be because of evidence. But then when you take the blindfold off and one of them says, I touched you, And you know that person's trustworthy, a credible witness. Now you know, but it's not on the basis of the touch, but you know on the basis of the evidence, the testimony. Well, now you think about that when it comes to what John the Apostle is saying about proving that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the eternal word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now go back and hook. First John chapter one to that, and you'll see that's exactly what John's saying. We touched him, we heard him, we felt him. We have fellowship with him, and we want you to have fellowship with him too. It all comes through knowing, knowing the facts of the case. Well, with all that before us, very quickly, we'll rehearse um, what we learned from this prologue. We learn Jesus is eternal. He is deity. He is the agent by which all things were created. He is the means and source of moral life. He is the one for whom God sent John the baptizer to bear witness. He is the true light, which brings light to every man. His own people did not receive him. To those who few, we may say, to those few who did receive him, that is, they believed on him, he gave the right to become children of God. I'll emphasize that again, to be brought to belief in Christ no matter how proper the means would be to bring one to believe in Christ as the Christ, the Savior, only gives one the right to become a child of God. It doesn't by itself make one a child of God. He is the word which became flesh and dwelt among men. He was characterized by the kind of glory which one would expect to be characteristic of the only begotten Son of God. We saw then from this prologue that he is full of grace and truth. He is the one prepared for and who was announced by his forerunner, John the Baptist, who God selected to do that. And he is, according to the testimony of John the Baptizer, greater than John. 
He is the means and source of abundant grace. He is the one in whom and through whom we have ultimate grace and ultimate truth. He is the only begotten Son of God. He is in the bosom of the Father. He's the one, he's the only one who has explained the Father. Now that's what you get out of the prologue when you just look at the facts of the matter. And I would suggest that you tend to do that with every chapter of the Bible as you study it. It is as though John were saying, here is my announcement of the attributes of Jesus Christ. Anyone who possesses these attributes must be deity. It's almost like he says, now, okay, I will proceed to prove to you that he did indeed possess these attributes. So in the rest of the chapter, we have the testimony of John the Baptizer. The Jews, and more specifically the Pharisees, in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to John. They were asked, or they were sent to ask him, who are you? They had been sent to find out whether or not John was the Christ. Well, John didn't mention any words. He spoke plainly, and we may say pointedly. He simply said, well, he declared, I am not the Christ. Well, they had um, other questions, these same priests and Levites. They ask, well, are you Elijah? Notice how plain he is. I am not. Are you a prophet? No. You know, I think about this. If he had been a modern day politician, he would never answer to these things like that. He would still be dodging this present hour. So we see what's characteristic of God be people. Thus, Paul would say, let your yea be yea, or the Lord did, and your nay, nay. So they ask after all this, well, who are you? What, what do you say about yourself? Well, we've got an obligation to report back to these people that sent us, and we want to know. Well, John answered, I am the voice, underscore voice, of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said Isaiah the prophet. Now that's found in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. And hopefully we'll get to that on Sunday morning. The priest and the Levites had another question. If you're not the Christ, and remember when they say that, they say they're meaning if you're not the anointed one, if you're not approved of God, because that's what the anointing meant, and if you're not the prophet Elijah, and if you're not the prophet, why are you baptizing? Well, John answers plainly, and he says, I baptize in water. But now among you, there stands one you don't know. It's that person who comes after me. The thongs of his sandals, I'm not even worthy to untie. Basically what you we would say today. Well, on the next day, the apostle John tells us that John the baptizer saw Jesus coming to him. And then John says these marvelous words. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, 
after me comes a man who has a basically saying when he says he's before me he's basically saying higher rank than i am and the reason why he existed before me well of course he did we've already seen that is the eternal word there's no beginning or ending he says and i did not recognize him but i came baptizing in water in order that he might be manifested to israel well john speaks further He says, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him. This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the son of God. Well, that's the first part of this. But now John by the Holy Spirit selects Andrew. John is standing with two of his disciples. And he saw Jesus walking. And John said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard John say that. And they followed Jesus. And there's where the Lord took hold. The Lord turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you see? You know, there's a, a great sermon in that. When we, through the scriptures, learn about Jesus or some way learn about Jesus, and we say we want to be a disciple or follow him, we would do well to answer that question Jesus put to them. What do you seek? It's amazing that a lot of people think they're seeking, uh, uh, they're seeking after Jesus. But they better be honest, they're, they're not really. It's to the reason that they're doing what they do. And we would do well to check our honesty before God in the scriptures to make sure that we are following Jesus because he is Jesus, and that's the only reason. Well, they ask him, Rabbi, where, where are you saying? That's master. Well, again, I think it's interesting how the Lord approached them. Come and see. They came, therefore, and saw where he abode. And they stayed with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. Now, one of the two heard John speak and followed after him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Well, Andrew found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Here's what Jesus said to him. You're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means a stone. Now, let's look at this a little more. I hear all sorts of people, and rightly so, encouraging members of the church to be busy in their personal efforts to win people to Christ, to teach people the gospel. Well, Andrew went straight to his brother, his fleshly brother, Simon. Now, let me ask you, ask you this. When you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or anywhere else in the New Testament, how much more do you read about Andrew? You don't. But you read about Peter. And look what all Peter did. But you don't read much about Andrew. Is there possibly a lesson in that for us? That maybe it's who we are influential over in bringing them to Christ that will actually accomplish a great deal more than maybe I would, but somebody bought, brought Peter to Christ and it was his own brother. People talk about, well, where do I find someone I can teach? Well, start with your own family. Now, that may be one of the hottest contests you ever got into, but it'll certainly get you ready for any others that may come down the road. 
You ever wondered why Stephen was preaching in the synagogue of the freedmen, it's just called, or the libertines? Because this was a Hellenist synagogue. Stephen is a Greek Jew. He wasn't born and raised in Jerusalem, Judea, Galilee. And when the people who came, and they were Hellenist Jews, they're not native to Judea, they had a synagogue where they met. Which also tells me that people can, because of their customs and personal likes and dislikes, gather together even as Christians, simply because they like one another, I guess you could say. <laughs> because the culture they have doesn't mean they don't despise that they despise others who are not like them. It just means they feel comfortable around them. Because they all have basically the same cultural approach to things, not talking about what's right and wrong. But the point being here is he went to the people that he knew and he wanted to convert them. Of course, it ended up him being the first Christian martyr. Nevertheless, that's a good example. So Andrew finds Jesus and he goes and gets his brother, Peter. Now, that's the first witness called to put on the witness stand by the Holy Spirit, or John by the Holy Spirit did it. The next one we see that John uses is the testimony of Philip. The Lord found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Philip found Nathaniel, and he said to him, now watch what he says. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. There sure is a lot there. First of all, if these ordinary people could know their Bible well enough to recognize identifying marks of the long-looked-for Messiah, what does that say about all the rest of the Jews as far as the hierarchy is concerned? They could too. But it also tells us that they recognize that Moses in the law wrote of the Messiah. And if they understood that, every other Jew could understand. They recognized or he recognized that the Messiah was written about in the prophets, he understood that. All the rest of them could understand. So sufficient is the evidence of the law and the prophets to point one to Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Messiah. Nathaniel said, going on with this, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That sort of lets me know people have always been the same way. There's always been a wrong side of the track somewhere. There's always been some place we didn't think very well of. And here's one of them. And it shows you the common understanding of people about Nazareth. Well, Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Well, now look at the testimony of Nathaniel. The Lord saw Nathanael coming to him. And he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now, Paul should say, Look at these people as to how they were living under the law, what the Lord said about them. It goes to show you why the scripture says the common people heard him gladly. They were not corrupted like Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests and scribes and others. Now, it's interesting to see how Nathaniel responds. He says, how do you know me? How do you know me? Well, you know, he didn't deny what the Lord said about him. He knew himself. He was an honest man. He knew how he lived. He knew what he did, what he didn't do. 
Well, Jesus answers, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Well, now, if that wouldn't cause a person to sit up and take notice, I don't know what would. And notice immediately the impact. Master or rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now, he had no, no problem at all to understanding the Messiah. It's all been incorporated in this all the way back up with Andrew going to get Peter and so on. He understood that Messiah and Son of God and King of Israel were all one and the same. Which shows you a person can know the truth when the hierarchy in the person's religion denies the whole thing. Or at least part of it. And notice what the Lord promises to Nathaniel. Well, you'll see greater things than these. If that, if that, if that amazed you, if that causes you to say what you say, then hold on to your hat. It'll be about greater things than that happen. And this ties back into what we said was the purpose statement of John, John 20, 30 and 31. All these signs and wonders that Jesus did, many, many of them outside of what's recorded in the scriptures. Now the Lord also promised Nathaniel, you'll see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Well, that's amazing. Sometimes we wonder how the apostles were able to undergo all the torment and persecution that they did for the cause of Christ and doing the things that God wanted them to do. Well, they were given privileges to see things and experience things that others weren't. Yes, this is an example of it we see here. Remember Paul talking about being caught up in the third heaven, seeing things unlawful to say. They were strengthened in ways that if they had not been strengthened. The early church would never got off the ground. And we would do well to be reminded that in the beginning of the material creation of the cosmos, of all things therein, it all started by a miracle. But then God's laws came into effect, his natural laws. And there are a multitude of them. And science still tries to research natural things to find out what other laws are there. How many laws are still involved that we don't know anything about because nobody's discovered? But if you look at the church, it started by a miracle. Look at the day of Pentecost. And you see there was a rushing, sound of a rushing mighty wind. No wind, but it sounded like a great hurricane. And it didn't go from the bottom to the top. It came from above and came down and it came to the house where the 12 apostles were, clothed in tongues like, not fire, but like as a fire set up on each of them. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All of it started the miracle. But then there are the laws of the gospel, the terms of pardon, the authority of Christ set out in his word that tell us how he wants to be worshiped, sets out plainly step by step the plan of salvation and so on. So all material creation began with a miracle, the natural law that God created and opposed by the word of his power continues to work until he calls it all to a stop. And when he started the church, the same way. All started by a miracle. But then once the word of God is fully revealed, confirmed to be the word of God and not the word of man, completed, then the apostles die and those they laid hands on and thereby conveyed miraculous gifts to them. They don't need that anymore. They've got the word, that which is perfect has come. And that which is in part shall be in a way. And so now the truth, you want to know about a miracle, I'll read you one in, in the Bible. 
people seem to think that just doesn't work. But God thought it would work. And time does not make a fact any less a fact. Be more specific, the passing of time does not make a fact any less a fact. It's still a fact. It's a fact that Jesus Christ walked this earth as a human being. It's a fact that he worked miracles, signs, and wonders to prove who he was. It's a fact that he died on the cross, he was buried, the third day he was raised, and he ascended to heaven later to die no more, and he promised he would come back again. I have no reason not to believe that promise. I have many, many reasons to believe the promise that he will come a second time. Now, here's what we have when we look at uh, chapter one altogether. Jesus is the one for whom John the baptizer, according to prophecy, prepared the way. He's the one who would come after John, but he was greater than John. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the one whom John the baptizer made manifest to Israel. He is the one whom God himself identified by specific sign to John the Immerser. He is, according to the testimony of John, who saw the sign, the Son of God. He is the Anointed One. He is the Messiah. Notice, he is the one, number one, of whom Moses wrote. Number two, of whom the prophets wrote. Number three, Jesus of Nazareth. Number four, the legal son of Joseph. He is the one who can look into and know the very hearts of every one of us and every person that ever lived. He is, according to Nathaniel, the son of God. He is the one in whom is fulfilled the real meaning of Jacob's vision of the latter extending to heaven. Well, our time's almost gone for tonight, and I'm not going to start into chapter two tonight. So we'll pause here, and again, I urge you that if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write them down. Oh, I do want to clarify one thing. I said last week, uh, because I get used to it, and others do too, use it, you don't think about it, but I pointed out that the nature of John's book is apologetic. For people who don't know the Greek word apologia, apologia, don't realize that we're talking about he's defending, he's setting out reasons for believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's not saying, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. That's the way we use apology today. So apologetics is the study of all those things that prove the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of scriptures. So I want to make sure for anybody that's not familiar with that, that uh, you will know that's what we mean when we say John's book is primarily apologetic. Well, before we close, let's go to our Heavenly Father and pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We pray, Father, for the kingdom that it might be strong and serves to thee. We pray for each citizen of the kingdom that we will strive to do our best to live according to the truth of thy son's word and to teach it to others as well as defend it. We pray that thou wouldst help us to ever be thankful for the new blessings of life. Help us to ever remember thy grace and mercy is extended to us through the gospel. Bless us as we labor to know more and apply it to our lives of thy good truth. And help us to long for the day that we can be in a glorified body like our Lord now possesses. To walk with thee and see thee and experience all that glory that our pitiful, finite, mortal minds cannot understand now. Help us to love the truth supremely. Help us to obey thee in every way. 
Give us hearts to easily move by thy word. Help us to do all we can to spread the borders of the kingdom. May we give thee the glory and the honor. For we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.